sir, Mithridates said. You are a just, humane man. I beg you not to condemn me before you have heard the arguments on both sides. Do not let a mere Greek who has craftily put together a tissue of slanderous lies about me carry more conviction for you than the truth. I realize that the woman's beauty contributes heavily to directing suspicion against me, since no one would find it surprising that a man should try to seduce Callerho. But I have always lived a respectable life. This is the first charge that has ever been laid against me. But even if I were a dissolute, licentious man, I should have reformed by your entrusting me with the government of so many cities. Who could be so foolish as to deprive himself of such blessings by his own choice in favor of a solitary pleasure, a disgraceful pleasure at that? And after all, even if I were conscious of misconducting myself, I could in fact have raised legal objection to the suit. Dionysius's accusation is not based on a legally valid marriage. His wife was offered for sale, and he bought her, and the law against adultery does not apply to slaves. He will have to read you the title of emancipation before he can talk of marriage. Are you actually calling her, her your wife, a woman sold to you by a pirate, Theron, who had snatched her from a tomb at that? Ah, but, he will say, it was a freeborn woman that I bought. Then you have kidnapped her, not married her. But I will answer your charges as though you were her husband. Consider the purchase a marriage. Consider the price you paid for her a dowry. She is a Syracusan, but for today let her count as a Milesian. I shall demonstrate, sir, that I have committed no crime against Dionysius either as her husband or as her owner. To start with, he accuses me of an act of adultery that has not taken place, but according to him was intended to take place. Being unable to quote facts, he reads out letters devoid of content. But what the law punishes is deeds. You produce a letter. I could say, I did not write it. That is not my writing. It is Charius who is trying to find Callerho. He is the one you should be bringing to court. Ah, yes, he will say, but Charius is dead. It is you who used a dead man's name to try to seduce my wife. Dionysius, you are throwing down a challenge to me. It is not at all in your interest. I swear to you, I am your friend. I am bound to you by ties of hospitality. Retract this charge. It is in your interest to do so. Ask the king to dismiss the case. Recant. Say, Mithridates is not guilty. My accusation was irresponsible. If you persist, you will regret it. You will be condemning yourself. I am warning you. You will lose Calerho. The king will find you the adulterer, not me. After this speech, he fell silent. Everybody looked at Dionysius to see whether he would withdraw the charge now that he had been given the choice or persist in it. They had no idea what these mysterious words of Mithridates meant, but they supposed Dionysius did know. He did not. It never occurred to him that Charius could be alive. His response was, Say what you will. You will not fool me with your clever arguments and plausible-sounding threats. Dionysius will never be shown to be fabricating accusations. Taking up from there, Mithridates raised his voice as if in a divinely inspired frenzy called out, Royal gods, gods of heaven and underworld, help a virtuous man. I have often prayed to you in proper observance and offered you magnificent sacrifices. Reward me for my piety, falsely accused as I am. Accord me charius, be it only for this trial. Appear, noble spirit, your Calerho summons you. Stand between the two of us, myself and Dionysius, and tell the king which of us is the adulterer. While he was still speaking, and this is how they arranged, had arranged things, 
Charius himself stepped forward. When she saw him, Calerho cried out, Charius, are you alive? and made to run to him. But Dionysius held her back, blocked the way, and would not let them embrace. Who could fitly describe that scene in court? What dramatist ever staged such an astonishing story? It was like being at, the, at a play packed with passionate scenes, with emotions tumbling over each other, weeping and rejoicing, astonishment and pity, disbelief and prayers. How happy all were for Charius, how glad for Mithridates, for Dionysius how sorrowful, and for Calerho they did not know what to think. She was in total confusion and stood there unable to utter a word. She could only gaze wide-eyed at Charius. I think the king himself, at that moment, would have liked to be Charius. When men are rivals for a woman's love, they are always easily provoked to violence. In this case, the sight of the prize made them even readier to fight. But for the king's presence, they would have come to blows. But they limited themselves to words. I am her first husband, said Charius, and I am a more reliable one, replied Dionysius. Did I put away my wife? No, you buried her. Show me the divorce papers. You can see her tomb. Her father married her to me. She married me herself. You aren't fit for Hermocrates' daughter. You're even less fit. Mithridates had you in chains. I demand Calerho back, and I am keeping her. You're laying hands on another man's wife, and you killed your own. Adulterer. Murderer. Such was their argument, and the audience enjoyed it. Calerho stood there with her eyes cast down, crying. She loved Charius. She respected Dionysius. The king dismissed everyone and discussed the matter with his friends. He was not now considering Mithridates' case. He had produced a brilliant defense. The question now was whether he should arbitrate about Calerho. Some held that that was not a matter for the king to decide. You were quite right to hear the charge against Mithridates. He was a satrap. But the people involved now were all private individuals. But the majority advised the opposite course, partly on the grounds that Calerho's father had done the royal household no little service, and also because this was not a separate case that they were bringing to his court, but virtually part of the case already before him. They did not want to admit the real reason that they could not tear themselves from the sight of Calerho's beauty, so he recalled those he had dismissed. I quit Mithridates, he said. Tomorrow he shall receive gifts from me, and he is to return to his own satrapy. Charius and Dionysius are each set out to their claims to the woman, because I must make proper provision for the daughter of Hermocrates, who defeated the Athenians, my and Persia's worst enemy. On pronunciation of this discussion, decision, Mithridates made an obsequence, but the others found themselves quite at a loss. The king saw their perplexity. I am not hurting you, he said. I will give you the chance to make your preparations before you come for the trial. I grant you an interval of five days. During that time, my wife, Tatira, and I will look after Calerho. It will be wrong for her to appear for trial in the company of a husband when the purpose of the trial is to determine who is her husband. So they left the courtroom. Everybody else was downcast. Only Mithridates was smiling. He collected his gifts, stayed that night, and set out for Caria the next morning, more radiant than ever.